Back to, uh, back to uh, the, okay, so the book of Concord. We'll talk more about this in just a minute here. But, um, all right, we're going to start by singing. Um, yeah, you can stand if you really want. Um, we're going to sing God's word is our great heritage because, you know what? The book of Concord is not an addition to the word of God. It is a confession of the word of God. It is what scripture teaches. Okay? All right, let's see. God's word is a great heritage and shall be ours forever to spread its light from age to age shall be our chief endeavor through life it guides our way in death it is our stay lord grant while worlds endure we keep its teachings pure throughout all generations. All right, very good. All right, <clears throat> so you're a Lutheran. What does that mean? <laughs> what would you say? What does it mean to be a Lutheran? What do we people, all right, first, let's get the caricatures out of the way, right? What do people tend to think of? We're grumpy. I'm grumpy? Yeah. Oh, man. Okay. What else? Catholic light. Catholic light. We worship Luther. We worship Luther. Yeah. Yeah. We don't? Oh, no. Okay. The most stuffy of the Protestants. Okay. Uh... Here, here's some of the things that are caricatures of Lutheran that, Lutherans that kind of actually drive me crazy. All right? What does it mean to be a Lutheran? Well, you have a lot of potlucks. <laughs> you sit in the back. You, um, yeah, you what's that? <laughs> ah, yeah, no, sorry. You, uh, um, you know, you make you make a lot of casseroles. Uh, you know, you eat a lot of bratwurst. You know, whatever. None of that has to, anything to do with being Lutheran. Some of those things have, you know, maybe a German heritage, and a lot of Lutherans have a German heritage. Not all. In fact, most don't, actually, at this point. Um, some of those things have just to do with being, like, in the Midwest, which has nothing to do with being Lutheran. Now, there are a lot of Lutherans that live in the Midwest, that is not a thing that really has anything to do with being Lutheran, right? We got our brothers and sisters in Christ down at Ebenezer. <laughs> I don't think they're going to be jumping for joy for bratwurst and sauerkraut. Um, they 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 don't have they, they don't you know have the, the the those kinds of same cultural things in mind, right? But they have the same confession. They have the same belief. To be a Lutheran is not based on any, any kind of cultural thing. It's based on our confession. One of the things that drives me crazy is somebody that, that goes, oh, yeah, I'm a Lutheran. Okay. Uh, when were you in church last? Well, you know, I was raised Lutheran. Okay. You're not living it out. You're not confessing it. Then, then that's not what it is to be a Lutheran, right? To be a Lutheran is... A confession of faith. It is what we believe, teach, confess, and confessing means also living it out, right? We don't just have our name on the roll and go, yeah, well, yeah, I guess I'm a member there, so I guess I'm a Lutheran. Um, that's not what it means. Uh, to be a Lutheran is to confess. And it is vital that we know what we believe and why we believe it. It's vital. Not just the pastor. Everybody. Because, well, there's a lot of reasons. First, 
I don't interact with people outside of the church as much as you do. <laughs> if you know what you believe, why you believe it, you can talk about those things with people. And guess who works through you? The Holy Spirit, right? Um, what happens if persecution comes and the pastor is not available? Well, you, you better be ready for that, right? Um, it should not depend on me. Okay? Some of my favorite people in, uh, in the Reformation, we're going we're gonna to walk through some of these here real quick. Um, these are all laymen. None of these are ordained clergymen. Okay, so when we think about the Reformation, when we think about Lutheranism, we tend to think of Martin Luther. <laughs> but these men were foundational and were examples of what it looks like to live out the faith. Okay, so uh, Gregory, and I want to want to do the the umlaut here, Brook. <laughs> Okay, he was a courageous Lutheran layman. He wrote the preface and the conclusion of the Augsburg Confession. And he stood there before the emperor as it was being read, knowing he was risking his life in doing this. Okay? Not a clergyman, not a professional church worker, a courageous layman. Philip Melanchthon, who wrote the Augsburg Confession? It wasn't Martin Luther. It was Philip Melanchthon. You know what? Philip Melanchthon, also not ordained, not a clergyman, not a church worker. He was a professor, and he knew theology. <laughs> he, in fact, wrote the book on theology for the uh, Lutherans in the, in the 15th or 16th century. Uh, his, his Loki is, uh, is just you know, really fantastic. At least the early ones were. Then it started to get not so good towards the end. But anyway... Melanchthon, again, not a clergyman. He wrote the Augsburg Confession. He took theology seriously, right? This is my favorite one here. George Margrave of Brandenburg. And we'll get to why he's my favorite here in a few minutes. But a Margrave was originally um, the, the medieval title for the military commander assigned to maintain the defense of one of the border provinces of the Holy Roman Emperor Empire. So um, it's kind of like being a prince, right? You're overseeing an area, um, but you're you're not you're not the kind of guy at the very top, but you're in charge of this area. So it's kind of like a the mixture of a of a of a general <laughs> and a and a mayor of a town. Um, he was both of those kind of things at the same time. We'll talk more about him in a minute. Okay. Now the Book of Concord, many Lutherans have never heard of it, don't know anything about it. And that's a shame because this is our confessions, right? This is, this is what we say we believe, teach, and confess. Um, the uh, constitution of our congregation holds me accountable to this. But you actually got to know what it says in order to hold me accountable to this. <laughs> And I would like for that to happen. That would be, that's a good thing, right? Uh, so C.F.W. Walther, the first president of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, um, said the Book of Concord should be in every Lutheran home. For that reason, our church should provide a good, inexpensive copy, and pastors should see to it that every home has one. If a person isn't familiar with this book, he'll think, that old book is just for pastors. I don't have to preach. After working all day, I can't sit down and study this in the evening. If I read my morning and evening devotions, that's enough. No, that's not enough. The Lord doesn't want us to remain children who are blown to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Instead of that, he wants us to grow in knowledge so that we can teach others. <laughs> Isn't that a cool quote? Uh, you know... It's great for pastors to know stuff, but it's awesome when lay people know, right? And when they are solid in what they believe. Okay. Uh, C. Fitzsimmons Allison, not a Lutheran, uh, Anglican, actually, I believe, uh, says, 
in his uh, book, The The Cruelty of Heresy. Theology, likewise, is too serious a matter to be left to the scholars. We cannot do without generals or scholars, but each of us must do our own contending and our own believing. Right? I can't believe for you. (laughs) You have to do that work of digging in, um, and that's what we're doing, right? I could teach you, but... um, you know, it, it, theology needs to be something that all of us take seriously. Okay, so uh, just a real quick um, overview here. Lutherans have always been defined by their beliefs, what we understand Scripture to teach. Uh, these beliefs are written in our documents that we call our confessions. Okay, and that's compiled in the Book of Concord, right? So the three creeds. Right, the Athanasian Creed, the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed, uh, the Augsburg Confession. That's what we're going to be focusing on. Um, the apology of the Augsburg Confession. Apology, not meaning like, oh, I'm sorry, but meaning, no, I'm not sorry. I believe this. <laughs> a defense. That's what that apology means. A defense of the Augsburg Confession. Uh, the small called articles. The Treatise on the Power and Privacy of the Pope, the Small Catechism, the Large Catechism, the Formula of Concord. Rick? Is, is that meant to include then both the Solid Declaration and the Epistle? Yeah, 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 yeah. So the Formula of Concord, the Solid Declaration is the longer version. The Epitome is kind of the condensed version of the Formula of Concord. Um, and, uh, well... If we get to the formula of Concord down the road, I hope, you know, I, th- I plan to get to the formula of Concord down the road, um, we'll probably focus more on the epitome because the solid declaration is <laughs> living up to its name. <laughs> it is a solid declaration and it is long and more um, more drawn out. So the epitome kind of just summarizes it more, more succinctly. Okay. All right. So the presentation of the Augsburg Confession. This is more so than October 31st, 1517, the defining moment in Reformation history. This really is. Um, you know, Reformation became a big celebration in America in part because it was a way of being like, hey, we're not Catholic, uh, <laughs> which is kind of not the reason to celebrate it, but um, previously, previous generations, uh, June 25th, 1530 was the day that was more celebrated because that's the day that the Augsburg Confession was presented. Um, You have the Confession of Faith being brought. Now, who goes and presents this? It's not Luther, (laughs) because they're not risking putting Luther out there at this point. Uh, They figure if Luther goes, they will kill him. (laughs) And they probably would have. So who goes? The German princes go. Laymen, not professional clergy. They go, they say, this is our confession of faith, and we're presenting this because this is what we believe. Scripture teaches. Um, I want to read from the introduction uh, to the Augsburg Confession uh, from, uh, again, the reader's edition here. On Saturday, June uh, June 25th, 1530, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Dr. Martin Beyer stood, walking toward the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, Charles V, and began reading the Augsburg Confession in a loud and distinct voice. Through the open windows, a hushed crowd outside in the courtyard hung on his every word, as did the 200 or so people gathered in the hall. Beside Dr. Byer stood Gregory Brooke, holding a copy of the Augsburg Confession in Latin. The German princes stood around them, stood up to indicate their support for the confession. The the emperor motioned for them to sit down. When Dr. Bayer finished reading, Dr. Brook took the German copy of the confession from him, handed both copies to the emperor, and said, Most gracious emperor, 
This is a confession that will even prevail against the gates of hell with the grace and help of God. Thus was the Augsburg Confession presented as a unique confession of the truth of God's holy word, distinct from Romanism on the one hand and Reformed Anabaptists and Radicals on the other. June 25th, 1530 is a date every bit as important for Lutherans as is the more familiar date of October 31st, 1517, the day on which Luther posted the 95 Theses. Uh, and I want to jump ahead here. Okay, this is... Okay. Um, on all, uh, the, 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 um, okay, so this is part of the, uh, the gathering at Augsburg. It says, later that evening, Charles and his brother Ferdinand, the king of Austria, met privately with the Lutheran princes. They ordered them to forbid any Lutheran preaching in Augsburg during the meeting. They commanded them to attend the Corpus Christi festival the next day with the emperor. Now, the Corpus Christi festival would be um, taking the, uh, the the host down the street, and people were supposed to, you know, um, venerate that, to adore that, to worship that. And the Lutherans were like, no, that's not what Jesus said to do. He said, take, eat. So we take and eat. Um, so uh, they commanded them to attend the Corpus Christi Festival the next day with the emperor, George Margrave of Brandenburg, spoke boldly for the Lutherans. He refused to concede to Charles' demands, saying, Before I let anyone take from me the word of God and ask me to deny my God, I will kneel and let him strike off my head. <laughs> the emperor, clearly taken back by George's boldness, stuttered in broken German, Not cut off head, dear prince, not cut off head. <laughs> I mean... That guy is bold, right? He's like, all right, you want to kill me for my confession of faith? Do it. But I am not going to budge from this. Uh, could we use that kind of boldness now? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, the world wants us to compromise. The world wants us to uh, to give up on what we believe, teach, and confess, and just, just, just go along to get along. Um <laughs> That's not the Lutheran way. <laughs> uh, I, I, I mean, it's just so cool that he, who's doing this? Is it a clergyman? No. It's a guy with responsibility over defending people. And he's saying, no, you want to kill me? Do it. But I will not um, deny my confession. Okay. So let's jump into the actual Augsburg Confession. We're going to look just at Article 1 tonight. And on Article 1, there's not a lot of disagreement with the Roman Catholic Church. Remember, the Augsburg Confession is presented to the emperor to say, we're not breaking off from what the church has always believed, taught, and confessed. We're, we're trying to get back to what the church had always believed, taught, and confessed. We're, we're not doing something new. This is what the church has always rightly been. Okay, so Article 1, our churches teach with common consent, our, our, our churches with common consent do teach that the decree of the Council of Nicaea concerning the unity of the divine essence and concerning the three persons is true and to be, uh, to be believed without doubting. That is to say, there is one divine essence which is called and which is God. Eternal without body, without parts, of infinite power, wisdom, and goodness, the maker and preserver of all things, visible and invisible. And yet, there are three persons of the same essence and power who are also co-eternal, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And the term person they use as the fathers have used it to signify not a part or a quality in another, but that which subsists of itself. They condemn all heresies which have sprung up from against this article as the Manichaeans 
to assume two principles, one good and the other evil. Also, the Valentinians, uh, Arians, Eunomians, Mohammedans, and all such. They condemn also the Samosatians. <laughs> I always struggle to say that one. Uh, old and new, who contending that there is but one person, sophistically and impiously argue that the Word and the Holy Ghost are not distinct persons. That the word signifies a spoken word, and the spirit signifies motion created in things. All right. So, basically, they said, you know what? The Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the Athanasian Creed, we believe those things. We're not doing anything new. What the church has confessed, we confess. Uh, so, specifically, the, uh, the uh, Council of Nicaea is mentioned here. So, Council of Nicaea is called in 325 AD uh, in order to deal with the heresy of Arianism. And Arius, as you might remember from our, uh, our, our class in the fall here, Arius um, taught that Jesus is kind of like God, but he's not God. Uh, for Arius, he's he's about as close as you can get to being God, but he's not really God. He's a created being. Um, and so even though he may have been created before the foundations of the world, he's still created according to Arius. Well, that's contrary to scripture. That's contrary to orthodox teaching. And uh, the Lutherans are saying, no, we're not on board with that. Um, so the bishops got together. They uh, debated the teachings of Arius at the Council of Nicaea in 325 uh, to determine the truth from the Word of God, right? Where is the foundation for truth? The Word of God, not tradition, the Word of God, okay? Now, you get this, uh, this big battle that happens um, with the Nicene Creed. The Arians wanted it to say that Jesus is of a similar substance to the Father. So that would be homoousios in Greek. Okay, the, uh, the orthodox teaching is Jesus is the same substance as the Father, which is homoousios. So you get that one little letter, that little I there, right? So in Greek it would be a yoda. So, uh, you know, <laughs> what did Jesus speak about the law? Uh, you know, not one Yoda uh, will be removed. Um, that one little letter changes the meaning vastly. Um, and so if Jesus is similar substance, then he's not really God. He's kind of God-like. But if he's of the same substance, then he is God. Why does it matter? Who cares? Why does it matter? This is a lot of arguing over one little letter, right? Well, if he is not of the same substance, then he's not God, then his death on the cross is not substitutionary payment for all sins for all people of all time. Not only that, but he's a liar because he claims to be God. <laughs> uh, and uh, the, the, the other uh, sections of scripture that speak of him as God are, uh, are problematic, right? Um, you know, book of Revelation, twice John bows down to worship an angel, and the angel says, no, 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 don't worship me. But Revelation chapter 5, when you have the Lamb, right, Jesus, he receives worship in the throne room of God. So, yeah, he's God, and it does matter. Okay, so it's, uh, is this just history? All right, so in uh, 2014, a survey of evangelical Christians uh, twenty-two percent said the Father is more divine than Jesus. So twenty-two percent were like, "Yeah, that Arius guy was kind of right." Um, that's a problem. Uh, it's also part of what happens when you take creeds out of services and people don't actually know them. Um, another nine percent said they weren't sure. Sixteen percent said Jesus was the first created creature by God. <laughs> That would be problematic. That would be, again, Arianism. 
That would be saying he's not really God. He is a creation of God. Um, 11% weren't sure. In the same study, 51% of those asked said the Holy Spirit is a force, not a personal being. So is the Holy Spirit God, or is the Holy Spirit a force sent out by God? Well, it, it, it's a big difference here. Yeah, Peter. Um, is, it, is it true, could you say that anybody who denies the Trinity is denying God himself? Yeah. yeah. And therefore, yeah. avoids so, salvation? Yeah, it's, it's like, um, um, you know, if, if, if I tell you that... Um, you know, we're gonna we're gonna go meet at a restaurant, and I give you the name of the restaurant, and you think it's one place, and I say, it, and I'm thinking of another place. Um, you're not gonna be at the right place, right? If you have, if you're, if you're uh, calling on God, generic God, that can mean a whole, whole different number of things. Um, what, who is the God of the Bible? The God of the Bible is the Triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And uh, if you are denying one of those persons, then um, you don't have the right God. Yeah. Isn't that why you're not allowed to preside over ecumenical or interfaith gatherings? That's part of it. That's part of it. Yeah. Um, you know, so if you, if you have an, a, an interfaith gathering, that, okay, let's say that there's a tragedy that happens and all of the community wants to get together, um, we're all going to pray. Well, which God are we going to pray to? Um, it's all the same, right? <laughs> it's just a force. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 see, the theology has implications, doesn't it? Um, and, and it's not enough for me to know these things. You need to know these things. Um, okay, yeah. Rick? So, it's not drastically different than um, the Jehovah's Witnesses, at least in, sen in a sense of, you know, they say that Jesus was the first created being, mm -hmm. and then all other things were created by Jesus. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> yeah. I mean, there's all kinds of variations of ancient heresies. Um, there are no new heresies, right? They all just kind of are repackaged. Um, in, in, but you can always go back and go, oh, yeah, that's what that is. Um, and we'll talk more about those here in a minute. Okay, um, so in the uh, Confession of Faith, it says our churches condemn... Manichaeans, Valentinians, Arians, Eunomians, Muslims, Samosatanists. <laughs> uh, you don't have to know about any of those. <laughs> if you know the truth, then you can see where there are false teachings. Um, so you don't need to know all about Man the Manichaeans. Okay? They come from uh, a guy named Manny. And... Um, he, he had all kinds of, uh, beliefs that, that kind of sort of sounded Christian-ish. Uh, it's kind of like the new age stuff today where it's like, oh, that sounds kind of, and then the more that, that you hear, the more you're like, oh, no, 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 that's not Christian at all. Um, you know, Valentinians, Arians, Eunomians, um, you don't need to know about all of them. Okay. It's okay. It's good to know about those things, but. Primarily, what do we need to know? The truth. <laughs> if you know the truth, you can see error. You can identify error. If you have that standard by which you can measure what is right, well, then, then you can avoid what is wrong. That's one of the reasons you have confessions of faith. Confessions of faith help you to go, is that right? Is that not right? Uh, and so... You know, the Augsburg Confession helps us to, to hear uh, teachings and, and filter it through that and go, oh, is, that, is that really what the Bible teaches or is that not? Okay. Uh, so according to the uh, theologian William Porcher DuBose, all heresy can be divided up into two basic types, docetism and ebionism. Uh, and, uh, okay. Uh, well, I should have, uh, I should have used a, another one here. But anyway, so basically, uh, docetism is 
Jesus seems to be like God, or seems to be, uh, I'm sorry, seems to be human, but really is only God, kind of in the shell of a human. Not really human. Uh, uh, adoptionism, or uh, Ebionism here, would be, he's a human, but he was really, really, really awesome, really good, so much so that God the Father's like, I'm going to adopt him. That's going to be my son. I will claim him as my own. Okay, so in one instance you have Jesus as God, but not really man. In the other you have Jesus as man, but not really God. Now, you know this from Sunday school, right? Is Jesus fully God? Yes. Is Jesus fully man? Yes. How can it be that he is both? <laughs> we don't have to explain it. <laughs> we just have to confess it. We don't have to explain it. Try, try to explain God, right? We can't because we are finite. God is infinite. It's going to be impossible for us to grasp everything about God because we are little bitty. And he is almighty, right? Okay, so docetism is the teaching about Christ, uh, Christ's spiritual and divine nature that sacrifices his human and historical nature. So according to docetism, and this was all done, these things come about with, with good intentions. So the idea was Jesus, we know he's got to be God. We know that. And God can't suffer. For God to suffer doesn't make sense in our minds. So Jesus must have kind of been in like, he had the like a, a, a robot body or something, like a, a shell of a body. But he wasn't, that the body wasn't really him. Because God can't suffer. God can't die. <laughs> well, we're back to uh, what we talked about a couple months back. Um the magisterial use of reason and the ministerial use of reason. That's the magisterial use of reason, saying, I know X about God, therefore God can't do this. And God says, but I did that. <laughs> okay? So this is a problem when we try to impose what we believe must be, that must be true on Scripture, rather than saying, what does Scripture say? That is true. Yeah. Did God really say you can't eat that? It's exactly that. Yeah. Did God really say? Yeah. It's exactly the same temptation as Satan in the in the in the uh, Garden of Eden. Okay. Um, oh, apparently, I didn't give you the actual other definition for adoptionism. So I'll give that to you right here, right now. So the so the other the other way would be the the adoptionist, the eunomian, uh, would be. Um, Jesus was born of Mary, was really good, and it just did such a good job that God the Father is like, hey, I'm going to adopt you as my son. And so now what does he become? He becomes this standard that we can follow. He becomes, okay, you want to be a child of God? You have to, X, Y, and Z, do all of these things. And what does it do? It puts you back under the law. Jesus ceases to be Savior, and he only becomes example. Now, is Jesus an example for us? Mm -hmm. Absolutely! Is Jesus only an example for us? Oh, man, if he is, we're in big trouble, because we haven't lived up to it, and we can't live up to it. Jesus is Savior. So, you go, okay, what does it matter if Jesus is 100% God, 100% man? The theology implications that um, are, are massive and knowing where you stand before God having the comfort of the gospel it all is tied together okay I'm just going to ask uh, if, if Jesus is such a good example for us does that mean that if I wear my magical underwear and I'm as good as he is I get a planet <laughs> not for you <laughs> <laughs> okay now um, article one of the uh, 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 Apostles' Creed of uh, the uh, the uh, uh, <laughs> Oxford Confession. 
is basically just restating what the church has already already been stating, right? And we're, the, the Lutherans come along, they go, hey, you know, all those things that you've already been confessing, we believe those. We're not something new. We're not a new thing. We are believing things that the church has always believed. And uh, this is um, kind of a great quote to kind of conclude this uh, introduction with. Um, the mightiest weapon with which the Reformation employed uh, against Rome was not Rome's errors, but Rome's truths. It professed to make no discoveries, to find no unheard of interpretations, but taking the scriptures in that very sense, sense to which the greatest of her writers had assented, uncovering the law and the gospel of God, which she retained, applying them as her most distinguished and most honored teachers had applied them, though she had made them of no effect by her traditions, the Reformation took into its heart the life stream of 16 centuries and came forth in the stature and strength of a ripened manhood of that mature period. There was no fear of truth, simply because Rome held it, and there was no disposition to embrace error because it might be employed with advantage to Rome's injury. <laughs> Basically, what Krauth here is saying, Krauth is a, probably the, the greatest American Lutheran theologian, uh, perhaps anyway, one of the greatest. Eh? Um, he's saying the reformer's greatest weapon was saying, actually... Everything we believe, everything we teach, everything we confess, it's already there in the history of the church. This is nothing new. Okay. Um, questions, comments, thoughts? Um, let's see if anybody has anything here. Uh, we got, uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Arianism. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> so here's, here's why I want to study the Augsburg Confession. I have very little interest in, in teaching you history here. Okay. There's going to be history tied up in it. I really don't care to be a history teacher with this because that doesn't really matter that much. What matters is truth. I want to focus not on the history of how the Augsburg Confession came about. We're not going to have a big history lesson about that. We're going to see what God's Word teaches so that we know it, we can confess it, and we can confess it in our lives. We can live out the truth, and we can be a light in the world. we got to know the truth in order to live the truth we got to know the truth in order to make the truth known. And, and that's what we're going to do. Okay? Thoughts, comments, questions, anything uh, before we wrap up tonight? <laughs> Gail says she needs a new book of Concord. Hers is copyright 1959. That's the Tappard edition, I believe. Which is great and very usable still. Um, don't feel like you have to get a new one. That's, that's a good one. Um, but the, the new one does have some advantages. And uh, Tappert likes to use a lot of Latin terms. He assumes you know Latin. <laughs> uh, this one does not. <laughs> uh, do we have a, a list of, of intended readings for the upcoming week so we can go and read ahead of time? Uh, well, most of it's going to be the articles of the Augsburg Confession. Okay. So if you read those. As far as we get. Yeah. Just keep on yeah, we're going to kind of just walk through those. Yeah. Yeah. Rick? I don't imagine you're probably going to get into this, but it's always bothered me a little bit by the fact that Melanchthon did such a solid job of writing this, and then he seems to compromise later yeah. in life. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, I mean, Melanchthon's human, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so he's feeling pressure, and he's feeling pressure later in life after Luther dies okay you're the leader guy and not everybody's made to be leader guy <laughs> and he's feeling this pressure to try to reconcile everything um, 
Melanchthon had the spirit, so it worked really well when you had Luther and Melanchthon, because Luther was the guy that was like, <laughs> and Melanchthon was the guy that could be like, hey, settle down a little bit, right? Um, and, and when you have those two combined, you kind of get the best of both worlds. Um, later on, Melanchthon feels this pressure to try to um, compromise the, the, the Augsburg Confession for the sake of peace. And, and there were literal wars going on. So it wasn't like, you know, just, just stress. <laughs> it was like, people are dying over this. And, well, can we use different wording that might make everybody feel okay with it? And then we can not have this war and have people dying. And not have, have you know, famines that result because of war. And have, you know, children going, growing up without fathers. And, and so he's got this, this, this weight on him. Uh, and he did compromise uh, later in life. And not in a good, good way. So, so do you think that his compromise essentially was the start of the stuff that happened that ultimately then forced the need for the formula of Concord. Yeah, that was part of it. That was part of it. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah, so later on you get uh, uh, Chemnitz and uh, Andre and the formula of Concord is, is developed to go, all right, no, we're, we're going we're gonna to get in writing, you know, the, the right confession here. Um, uh, and, and you'll see on a lot of uh, a lot of Lutheran churches, UAC, right? On the picture uh, we had on the uh, the advertisement thing for the the class, UAC, unaltered Augsburg Confession, because it was a way of saying, no, not that one that Luther uh, that uh, uh, Melanchthon uh, tinkered with down the road later on. We don't believe that. We believe the unaltered, the not changed one. Uh, and so a lot of Lutheran churches, when they came over to the United States. The cornerstone would have UAC uh, because it was a way of saying we're not part of the the Prussian Union where they uh, just have people who are Reformed and people who are Lutheran kind of pretending that there are no differences when there when there are um, and, and that's not to say that they said well the Reformed they're not even Christian no, that's not that's not it at all but it's being honest about what you believe being honest about where there are differences and not pretending that those things don't exist. Yeah. All right, anything else? All right, let's, uh, let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the opportunity to gather together to, to spend this time studying, um, being refreshed by, uh, by the truth found in your word. Uh, we give thanks for those who have come before us, who confess the faith, um, and, and did so boldly and faithfully. And we pray that we would follow in their footsteps, that we would be bold, we would be faithful, uh, so that your truth can go out into the world and be believed and shape and change our world as well. Uh, be with us as we uh, travel home tonight. Bring us safely home and, and bring us back safely uh, on Sunday to receive the gifts that you have for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. God's blessings.